Um, I'll be presenting some very preliminary results from an ongoing project on manure strategies in the uh, Lake Bronze and the Iron Age based on geoarchaeological investigations of uh, selected cultic fields. So in the period from around 700 BC till uh, AD 200, we see that the arable farming in Denmark and large parts of uh, Northern Europe are based uh, or are taking place in these Celtic fields, uh, which are characterized by uh, this net-like pattern of field uh, boundaries uh, that enclose the individual fields. And uh, the boundaries are, uh, <laughs> are either these uh, low banks um, uh, in the flat terrain or lynches in, in more sloping terrain. In some areas where these, um, uh, in some areas these uh, field systems were covered by heathland or woodland after abandonment, and this means that sometimes when we go out in the, what we call marginal uh, areas today, we can still find these field systems preserved uh, uh, in the landscape. This means we can actually go out there and sample directly from the prehistoric field systems. So. Uh, two years ago in uh, Sardinia at the DIC conference, uh, I presented the uh, results from my PhD project where I'd been looking at the Celtic fields of Østerlem Hill, situated or uh, located in, uh, okay, I'm not very good at this, <laughs> uh, located in, the, in Western Jutland. Here we uh, uh, looked at the uh, um, we looked at trenches, uh, we made through, uh, four trenches um, cutting through the banks on the adjacent fields and took samples. Um, and uh, based on studies on these uh, samples, we could conclude that um, there were at least four different types of material that had been added to the, uh, to the, uh, to the fields. Farmyard manure, household waste, material from wetlands and material from heathlands. And we could also see that there were some variations between the different uh, areas within the field system. Um, after finishing this project, we really wanted to kind of continue our studies on Celtic fields because are there any like regional variations in the way manuring has been practiced? And also, uh, we really would like to look more into the, um, the possible variations within these field systems. So uh, fortunately I got funding for a new research project where I'm now uh, looking at exactly this, uh, variations in manure practices between different field systems and within individual field systems. So when uh, looking at the, uh, or when studying Østerlem here, we found out that multi-element analysis by ISOPMS was actually quite useful for studying field systems. So we definitely wanted to continue using this, uh, this method here. Uh, and uh, then we also wanted to combine it with the XIF just to uh, look at the silica content of the samples. And then uh, as uh, supplementary methods, we wanted to use micromorphology and also analysis of pollen and uh, non-pollen pollen morphs. And the way we decided to do sampling this time was not just to make a trench uh, through uh, the banks and the adjacent fields, but to focus a bit more also on uh, taking uh, samples uh, from the surfaces of these um, f uh, individual fields to see the, like the spatial variation. So um, we are looking at three different sites, uh, Silkeborg Vesterskov being the main site uh, and the largest one, and then we also have uh, a Celtic field system in the Jordsbælle and the Boskov. They are all, they, these two are much smaller, uh, but they are all situated on uh, sandy till, so theoretically uh, they should have a comparable uh, parent material. Um, until if yeah, until last year, we really didn't have much uh, evidence of arable activity or any recordings of, uh, of uh, arable activity within Vesterskogen, only a few, in a few areas. And then suddenly, uh, oh, suddenly, I don't know, but uh, we, we got this new uh, lighter scannings of, uh, of the area, uh, a new um, local dominance model, and suddenly we realized, well, the entire uh, higher grounds, area of higher grounds here, but just covered with the uh, field boundaries. Uh, this is one of the biggest uh, field systems in Denmark. I know you have uh, much bigger field systems over here, but this is really huge uh, in, uh, in Denmark. So then, of course, we had the problem, where should we then sample? Um, 
we kind of had to uh, to focus on this area because it turned out that uh, large parts of the woodland is now covered by uh, coniferous uh, woodland, so we had very heavily fossilized soils, and also it's just difficult to penetrate through the vegetation. So we had to focus uh, on this area up here, and here we then um, uh, selected four uh, different uh, areas where we took samples from four fields. We also made a trench through one of the banks down here. Uh, this is just to show you what it looked like, and it was hell taking samples here because there were so many roots and it was really, really disturbed. Um, so I wouldn't advise you to, to go studying uh, things in the woodlands. It's just <laughs> really difficult. Uh, I managed to obtain some samples uh, in the bank as well as uh, in, the, in the fields adjacent to the bank. And then we took the samples uh, on the surfaces from, uh, from these fields, and we did that by taking uh, 16 random samples from uh, each uh, field plot and mixing it all together and taking a subsample from this, uh, which should then hopefully be a representative uh, average sample of the field plot. Um, then, of course, we also needed reference samples, and uh, the geoscience department in, at Aarhus University had been using these nice natural reference sa uh, samples from Silkeborg Vesterskov for years. But when looking at the LiDAR, we could see that they were actually uh, within the field system, so we couldn't use these. Um, fortunately, we had, uh, had some other uh, references that we could use at Holkrat. We know there has been no grazing or anything since the 16th century, so it's a natural woodland. Um, so it turned out that this would be a, quite a good reference sample, but um, we we're going to do statistical analysis and we therefore also wanted to have more references. Uh, so we ended up including also the, the refer reference from Mr. Lemhild and two references from Alstokrat. Uh, These are not perhaps the best suitable references, but for now um, we are using these. We are, we are currently trying to find uh, better references um, for the project. So now I'm just going to uh, present some of the preliminary results that we have so far. Um, so the first thing we did when uh, obtaining the, the data set from the multi-element analysis was to do a principal component analysis to see if we could see any kind of patterning in the data set. And um, when plotting PC1 versus PC2, we can see that probably PC2 is reflecting um, the depth or at least the soil horizons uh, in the data set. So generally speaking, we have the C horizons down here, then we have the B horizons, and up here we have the A horizons. There are you know, variations and there are some outliers, but there's a, a general pattern to be seen here. If we then plot PC1 versus PC3, um, we can see that these two principal components combined reflect the local soil conditions. Uh, probably the parent material, the texture, and also um, if you look at down here, you have the, uh, the elements uh, related to very uh, resistant minerals. Uh, so down here, we probably have some influence by um, uh, copper sand. And up here, you then have uh, elements related to uh, easily weathered uh, minerals, so the, the feldspars. So we have, when looking at how they, they are distributed on the graph, you can see that they are different, uh, they are not completely, uh, they have different parent material, they are not uh, completely comparable, although we can see that Holkrat and Silkeborg Westerskov are actually uh, situated quite closely together, and um, Holkrat might be a, a good reference for, for that side. Um, so when doing the uh, principal component analysis, we can see that it's primarily reflecting the natural conditions and the natural processes. But um, then if you look at these uh, elements over here, we see that um, these are elements that are often associated with uh, human activities. So the, since they are placed over here in the diagram, this might indicate that these have actually been influenced by human activities in the, in the field system. Otherwise, at least some of these uh, elements you would expect to, to be uh, uh, placed together with some of the other elements over here. So these potentially might be uh, interesting. 
If we look at the <coughs> concentrations and the A horizons uh, relative to the reference samples, we see quite clearly see that we have Silkeborg versus Gold down here, then we have the uh, the Jorsbell uh, concentrations here, and then on top we have the concentrations from Boops. And this probably primarily just reflect these differences in the parent material as indicated by the, the PCA. So to begin with, the, uh, the soil at Boops clearly was um, uh, more nutrient rich than the soil at the, um, at the Silkeborg Vesterskov. So this, of course, makes it quite difficult for us to uh, identify variations between these different sites. So I'm not too happy about that. But um, still, there might be some things that we can, uh, uh, we can get out of this. So, um, well, um, there are three elements that are enhanced <coughs> in all of these sites. It's manganese, nickel, and phosphorus. At Østerlem Hed, when we did the, the analysis here, phosphorus and manganese were actually the, um, the elements that we identified as being markers for uh, probably animal manure. And these were, were quite uh, good for, for identifying this. And now, uh, here at these uh, sites, we see, uh, see uh, also manganese and phosphorus being uh, enhanced. So we are actually quite happy about that. Um, of course, it's uh, because of these different parent materials, it can be difficult to, to compare them directly. But still, we can see uh, Silkeborg Vester score is only s is slightly enhanced while we see uh, more enhanced values uh, at Jorspel and Bose. And when considering that uh, Bose and Jorspel are much smaller um, uh, field systems, this uh, might make sense because, uh, well, you the manure must have been concentrated on smaller, uh, in a smaller number of fields compared to this huge uh, site at uh, at Silkeborg Vesterskov. So it, it could make sense, and there might be some differences. Um, another thing uh, is that uh, at Østerlem, the strontium turned out to be a really good marker for um, the addition of, uh, of um, uh, household waste uh, onto the fields uh, from, uh, from bones. Um, and uh, we were really happy about looking at strontium at Østerlem Hill, but when we look at it here, as also indicated by the, the principal component analysis, this kind of follows uh, the elements that you also find in feldspar. So it's much, we can't really use it as evidence for, for, uh, for the amendment of bone uh, in this case. Then I also just want to point your attention to a curious feature. Um, at Østerlem Hill, we saw that uh, a very depletion of cobalt within the field system, but we were a bit unsure about this result. Now we see the sa exactly the same thing is happening here at uh, these three field systems. So this suggests this is uh, perhaps a general trend for the field systems uh, of this time, and something we, we kind of want to look more into. Um, I don't know if uh, cobalt is hyper accumulating in, in, the, in grains or in the crops growing on the fields and thereby being removed. If any of you have any suggestions, I would uh, really like to hear about it. But anyway, this is potentially quite interesting because uh, if uh, soil contains too little cobalt, then this can cause a disease among the grazing animals, especially sheep. So this is definitely something we are going to, to, look, to look more into. If you then uh, look more closely at Silkeborg Vesterskov, uh, here the red uh, is showing the, the uh, phosphor phosphorus content in the Holkrat, and then we have the bank results and the fields, and you can see they are slightly enhanced values. Uh, also up here you can see we have there's some enhanced phosphorus values, not a lot, and especially if you look at the values, this is not heavily manured soil in any way. Just, just a little. Um, and you can also see that there are differences between uh, the different areas within the field system. So if you then look a bit closer at the different fields, well, um, again, you can see the phosphorus values, the, the blue, and clearly we have uh, like the red and the green um, group of, um, of fields are generally, um, generally show more evidence of phosphorus and also manganese and could be um, perhaps uh, these are probably have been manured more than, than the other groups of fields. Um, 
why we have these really high manganese values, I'm not sure. Again, if any of you have any suggestions, please come and tell me. Um, but what is also the interesting in that it's not only the red and the green that are enhanced, but we also see variations within uh, the individual fields. So for instance, field four is clearly enhanced phosphorus. Uh, over here, we, we have not a lot of, uh, of uh, phosphorus in concentra uh, concentrations. So, so there are differences between groups of fields and also uh, within these uh, groups. If you look at the strontium, um, well, uh, again, this might be due to uh, weathering feldspar, um, but uh, again, it's the same group of fields that we see enhanced values in. And uh, um, what is interesting is that, well, we did the XIF and we looked at the silica uh, content, and this seems very um, stable. So it's the, the differences that we see uh, in, in the element concentrations is it, it cannot be explained by the different concepts of silica, so it's not that there's more quartz sand in some of the samples that can explain this. Um, also, we can see um, when looking at some of the other elements um, that we might be uh, indicative of human activity. Again, we see the red and the green ones are the ones um, that are most uh, enhanced in, in, the, in these elements. So. Clearly, we can see that differences among different groups of fields within the field system. Um, and how do you then explain this? Uh, we have to think about that, but uh, naturally, if you look up here, this is the northernmost uh, part of the field system. So if the settlement has been further to the south, um, these fields might not have been used uh, as often, and uh, well, you don't want to carry you know, the menu for, for too long uh, if, you, uh, if you don't have to. Uh, so that might explain some of the variation that we see. Uh, over here we have um, the fields. Uh, these were also the fields that we don't see uh, uh, any significant enhancement. And here we have kind of steep slopes, which also may uh, have caused these fields not to be used as much, or we can perhaps we can see some more erosion that kind of dilute the, the um, the signal of the human activity. We have to think about that. Um, but then, of course, you also have the variations within the individual groups. So we have uh, field four down here, which uh, shows uh, a lot of enhanced uh, uh, enhancement in different elements. Uh, and how do you explain that? Um, well, perhaps this is just uh, you know differences in the way the different fields have been used, or we also have to acknowledge that um, the farmers back at that time also had the different ability of actually manuring the fields depending on how many uh, animals they had. Um, so we can't say anything for, sh for sure, but, but at least we can, uh, can say that there are differences and variations. So conclusions so far, you can see that fields were only sparsely manured, especially at Silkeborg Vesterskov, and uh, especially phosphorus, possibly also manganese, uh, uh, indicate the addition of uh, animal manure. Um, the strontium is not as useful uh, in, uh, in these field systems that we have been studying here in eastern Jutland, uh, in contrast to what we saw at, uh, at Østerlimhed. So there are some differences. Um, and we can see there are significant variations within the field systems. Uh, and uh, when doing a man yitten test, we could see these are statistically significant differences. So it's not just you know, really small variations. And this is something you really have to take into account if studying field systems, that you can't just go out in the field and take a few samples from, uh, from the field system because you have this variation. So um, preferably, you would take a lot of samples, also more samples than we have been able to do uh, in this project. And then uh, we have to admit that it's difficult to identify variation between sites just based on the multi-element analysis. Um, and uh, we are really looking forward to, uh, to get um, the micromorphology done and, and also the pollen analysis. Hopefully that will help us to, uh, to get some additional information that can help us interpret uh, what we see here at, the, at these sites. So thank you. Thank you.